Hello. Welcome to Ponies and Role Playing Games. Uh, but, uh, that the picture gives you an idea of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so I imagine all of you here have seen the Dungeons and Discords episode, right? If you haven't, you're a little behind, but that's okay. Uh, you hit a button. I did hit a button. You did. All right. I was so, so we'll do intros first. Uh, a little bit about each of us. So to begin, uh, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Arcadian Phoenix. It's really nice being here for all of you guys. I am the contributing artist for Pony Finder, one of many, and I am very proud to be a part of that project. And uh, and I am Brony Brewer, a uh, a home brewer and dispassionate moderator. I've been running a Pony Finder campaign for uh, a little bit over eight months. I've had a lot of fun doing that. Um, and uh, I, uh, I see one of my players here. Thank you, Sapphire. <laughs> you did. You did. Thank you. Uh, and that fits. Uh, I'm Icon Empire, a.k.a. Snake. Um, and I'm just a role player who's been at it for a long time with the same running continuous campaign since... Maybe the show started, and I see more than a few of my role players here, and I've just been DMing the same campaign for more than four years now. Awesome. And last but not least, we have David Silver, the creator of the Pony Finder campaign setting. Give him a big round of applause, everyone. I didn't even say anything yet. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> But no, I've been with the show in general since the first season, and I started making Pony Finder in the second season or so, and I've been stuck with it ever since. Did God help me? <laughs> <laughs> so, a little bit about what we're going to talk about. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a tabletop role-playing game is, we're not here to talk about, uh, like, Zelda or... Uh, mm -hmm really any other kind of role-playing games except tabletop, where you're actually rolling dice to figure out what you're going to do. So, some things about a tabletop specific role-playing game. I'm role sorry to game. tell you, but I, I think I might be at the wrong panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, then why are you here, David? I don't know. I don't know. I'm at the wrong convention. <laughs> you might be. I thought this was MAGFest. <laughs> Oops. Uh -huh. Oops, well, you're ours now. Sorry. So, so the thing about tabletop role-playing games in specific is it's a game of the imagination. It's only limited by what you can think of, like the limits that you can imagine, as opposed to something like World of Warcraft, where it's pretty hard and limited. There's really not a whole lot you can play with, but with tabletop role-playing games... The GM is the guy who figures out where you can go and what you can do. So it's also pretty, it's a collaborative environment. Uh, you have to work with your, your game master to figure out exactly where you're, you're going to go and what you're going to do with the characters you create. Uh, and in specific, uh, David, I know you did uh, your Pony Finder game tonight. So tell us a little bit about what you did tonight with the uh, the Pony Finder game. Okay, so I introduced my happy poor players to the world of Everglow by thrusting them into the situation of being academy cadets who are just about to graduate. Hurrah! They, they, they Yay, were graduation. They were all they all happened to be playing various show characters. So you know we had Twilight and Spike and bunch of other random people that had no business being there but that's okay our imaginations made it work <laughs> and they went off and there was much insanity possibly a little more than was warranted but everybody had a really good time which is pretty much the end goal of the game if everybody had a good time you did it right 
<laughs> That's right. There's really no other bottom line there. Did everybody have a good time? You did it right. <laughs> Doesn't matter if, as the GM, the players went where you wanted them to go. It has no say in whether it was a successful game or not. If the players had a good time, if you had a good time watching them mess up and try and scramble out of the situation, then it was a successful game. Exactly. So with, with tabletop role-playing games as opposed to other role-playing games, you're controlling one, one player at a time. You're playing one character. Uh, and that's a pretty big part of what we'll talk about. Uh, where we'll where we'll go into we've got a lot of stuff to discuss like 30 40 minutes of stuff to talk about maybe and then uh, we'll open the floor up for discussion and questions and whatnot if we don't ramble if I if if uh, me David Dan don't don't ramble too we're much we're all a bunch of ramblers <laughs> we are doomed. it's uh it's kind of part and parcel with uh, with the whole DM thing but uh but there's a couple of things, a uh, couple of things like we need to talk about. But the first one, uh, getting into character, uh, and we talked about this, like AKA horseplay. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so, and I don't have anything on my screen here, so I'm like, I'm like craning my neck like a giraffe to see, to see what it. exactly is going on. Should be easier. That, maybe. That, that's the same. <laughs> okay. I can't see that either. So. Okay, so I'm going to suddenly butt in like a rude person that I am. <laughs> feel free. Feel so free. when playing an equine, you have to remember that you're not a human, <laughs> which is kind of an important thing that a lot of people forget because they will act just like a person even though they are not a person. You are not a human being. You don't even have hands, <laughs> which is an amazingly simple thing that people will quickly forget. Uh, if you're GMing, this is a good time to sort of, you know, nudge people to remind them, no, you can't really do that thing. You have to be a little more clever than that. When somebody says, oh, no, I reach up and grab the thing. You grab me with your hoof? That's really not going to work. That <laughs> is not how horses work. Embrace the horse them. It's fun. Once you get into it, then suddenly things start making sense. I pass it forward. You're passing forward. Passing it forward. Yes. Yes, uh, for um, sure. I know in Pony Finder, at least, there is um, a set of rules specifically for embracing more of the fantasy aspects. You are a fake creature, so things don't always work as you think they should in reality. I will point out that even if you're playing by the strict rules, if your pony picks up a guitar, they can play the guitar. Don't ask how it works. It just does. Yeah, a lot Fairy of the magic, magic is like not really one. It's magic. It. You yes. don't have Although, to explain a thing. <laughs> Faye have specific magic with instruments. So if a pony knows how to play an instrument, they can pick it up and start strumming it despite the fact that they have hooves. And that's okay. Case in point, uh, Lyra, Lyra Heartstrings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. She also has actual magic. Um, so oh, one yes. of our first points. Wait, you mean any pony with piano? <laughs> exactly. Right, so one of our first oh, points up here is um, four legs versus two. <laughs> A lot of times you will forget that you are not standing on two feet. You take up two squares to move, depending on how big you are. I know Antians are large, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Big old brutes. But ponies, ponies are medium. Ponies are so medium. So they take up, they take up so like they, five, five, well, five feet. The regular so five foot by five. five. Yes. They, they are shorter than people, but longer than people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something that, as a GM, you can use to your advantage when you are devising your traps and adventures and their obstacles to play around. Also, as a player you can have a lot more fun galloping around instead of running on two feet or skipping is a lot more fun in your head when you have four legs. Mm -hmm. I like it. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> the, the biggest concern that I had was like disabled device. So when you're, when you're, for those of you who are familiar with Pathfinder, or Pony Finder, uh, those of you who have already bought <laughs> David Silver's uh, material, 
And those of you who have not, buy his stuff. <laughs> buy his stuff. Shameless promotion here. Exactly. But Average but when you're eight. when you're lock picking with your mouth, that is kind of a little bit of a different dynamic than it is Same to actually goal. manipulate things with your hands. There is a little bit of a like kind of a divide there when you're kind of like uh, I don't know. Uh. Is it going to work? I will point out at a GM, I've had this cut both ways. We have had ponies trying to pick locks and suddenly the blades go over their head where it would have cut a human in half. And we've also had times where the dart comes flying out directly into their face <laughs> because that's where their mouth is. That, Chunk, ow! And kind of I had to from... question a player once on how they uh, swung a broadsword, quote unquote, with, uh, with both hands. And I was like, that's an incredible feat. Because you're you're playing as a, a Pegasus, so so really, I want you to review this for me, step by step. Now, even from as you said, the player aspect, you can embrace things like that, like lock picking, for example. Your fellow companions are speaking to you, and you have your mouth full, so try to talk back. That's a lot of fun. So I try to do this without messing up here. Please leave me alone. <laughs> Dude, just hold up a hook. <laughs> and another consideration that, that I actually researched through a little bit of fanfic, a little bit of actual research, is that horses are allergic to avocados. Please don't eat the guacamole. Exactly. It's Yeah, it's like those are some those are considerations that you have to take in mind. When How you're often playing, does avocado show when up you're in playing your a pony character, it's like well, I, I, I like the guacamole. I, mean, I may or might may not like be everything. eating meat, but what exactly are you eating? Because that's kind of an important consideration for like being a character. Like, what are you going to eat? So Just what, raise on What grass you're actually or? telling me is that the next adventure I write should have a mystery, and there should be some avocado left behind, <laughs> and that's like the only clue as yes. to how they died. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if Griffin. This is now an avocado, avocado panel. That's a mystery to me. Maybe they can. I don't know. Now that being said, you don't have to go and research horses to be able to play. That is not I mean, what we're but saying. At why all. wouldn't you? <laughs> Though, if you do have a semi-vindictive GM, don't look at me. They don't might me. pull that out of their head. So it's just fun to maybe dig into it a little bit more. However, on the note of, um, uh, like you said, uh, what, what are they eating and those kinds of things, it doesn't always have to be loads of research, but a quick mental note does have to check. Oh, if you're in the inn, for instance, they're probably not going to be serving, I don't know, beef stew or something <laughs> like that. Because I've had a lot of players bring up that, you know, what their characters are eating. You're like, oh, my favorite food is, is meatballs. And it's like, uh, it's, suddenly, it's suddenly really questionable when you're a uh, little... Pony that he's hay and, hay and oats. <laughs> yeah, that's a little. That's a traditionally little weird. a prey animal. No, <laughs> it depends on what kind of horse. I could do a salad. Hey, there you go. I hope so. <laughs> hey, bacon. <laughs> and uh, that's and canon. we'll actually get a little bit more detail, on, like tails and manes and styling, when we get to the uh, the character design section. But. Uh, so some of you may some of you may already be involved in like Pathfinder campaigns or 3.5 campaigns, uh, especially for like the players out there. Uh, and obviously there may be some issues with trying to get your DM on or GM on board with like you playing a pony character, like you're a pony. And you've got like a dwarf, a human, and a half orc, and you're this like My Little Pony inspired character that <laughs> kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, and it can be a little difficult to work through. So, my kind of point with that is, is if you want to go that route, work with your GM, work with your DM and let them know what you're intending to do because you don't want to be singled out 
you want to be someone who can fit in with the campaign and have an like an in and a story that fits with everything else. Yeah, you don't want to clash. Exactly. If I might toss out an easy answer that fits in most campaigns, they are fake creatures. You can come from where all the other fake creatures come from and be a strange fake creature that other people might not like in character. Like, what the? Oh, God, it's a fae. It sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like he's got a, got a question about that. Did you just describe my current situation? <laughs> that sounds like my life. <laughs> it's all good. But uh, I'm having a, I don't have I don't have the slide in front of me. It's like completely blank on my laptop. So I'm like trying to squint my way through the slides. So feel free to so add as much or as little whimsy into it as possible. You don't have to be the pretty pan prancing little pony. You can be the gruff pony that will get along really well with the half orc. It doesn't have to be super super fay. Feel free to be the the ponyfied shaft. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. The ba the bam all the of examples the group. I would have used. <laughs> All right, I have a feeling you guys would like another concrete example of how you can slip yourself into a campaign. Let's say anybody in the party is playing a paladin. Anybody. The next time they summon their horse, you show up. <laughs> the paladin will be very confused. <laughs> But you should be good. He's like, hey, I'm here to, I'm here to help out. Oh, wait, my God sent you? Yes. <laughs> Let's smite some evil. <laughs> I'm here to kick ass and take names. <laughs> so for you GMs out there, uh, who, who here is uh, GMing or DMing game? Raise, show of hands. Okay. So a good, a good number of you. Thank you. Thank you. There's not enough. There's not enough GMs and DMs out there. There, there are not enough of us out there. There's no such thing. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It really is. But you, you kind of have to recognize that in in this particular now, all of you here, I I don't think that the top one is uh, is really a concern for you. But recognizing that a pony character is something that might get singled out that that's something you might maybe pick on a little bit. I don't think that's a concern. Hopefully, uh, that's not a concern for most of you. <laughs> I see maybe hand. favored a little bit. But... A little bit. <laughs> there is a hand over there. Is there a hand? You yeah, should recognize it. Either a one. little bit of both. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of both. I've seen I've seen it in both cases. And a lot of times I've seen the DM be completely fine with it, but the other players are kinda not really feeling the whole my little pony theme and they're like, I don't really know about this. This is Yeah. Yeah. You should always just run with it. <laughs> Make yourself the butt of every joke and then they have nothing to joke about. There you go. That's one tactic. Thank you, Deadpool. Completely exhaust the horse puns. <laughs> All of them. All the horse puns. One night, like you're done. I know it all too well. Let's face it, I'm Deadpool. Something else to take into consideration is that it might be easier to pick on the pony. You know, it's not necessarily a negative thing in your mind, but you have all these fun little things that you can pick on. I knew where I was going with this a second ago. I swear, it's that late. Kind of like a Sereno de Bergiac kind of a thing. Yeah, I mean, like you can Challenge take them all to their disadvantages and go. This is really easy. You have this; they don't. They can get you out of it. It's fine. You know, your party can come to your rescue, and it's an easy out for me. It's not necessarily meant as a negative, but after it happens again and again and again, 
you might start taking it one way and the player's taking it another. So it's just something to keep in mind. And and also keep in mind that, you know, a lot of a lot of D and D and Pathfinder, uh, you are a murder hobo. <laughs> you are killing things and taking their stuff. So a cute pastel pony is kind of the antithesis of kill things and take their stuff. So that's something that you kind of need to keep in mind, too. I actually avoid murder hobo companies. <laughs> I'm glad you do. <laughs> so, so, Sapphire, how, how murder... Now, this, this guy is already single you out, buddy. But uh, how, what I mean? murder hobo, how murder hobo is, uh, is our group? On a scale of one to ten. Does eleven count? <laughs> I I think that's fair. I, I think that's fair. Six and a half. That's good. Like six, six and a half. There's plenty there's plenty of loot to go around. Plenty of loot to go around. <laughs> I I hope. And and speaking of which, uh kind of a kind of an aside, but I, I know what your next ship is going to be. It's I sitting in the harbor. You. I'll send it I'll send it to you next week. <laughs> your next ship. We're we're playing an aquatic campaign, but I know what your next ship's gonna be. So what you're saying is that his next ship is an actual It's an actual ship. I took a water. picture of it here in Baltimore. <laughs> of all places. Okay, just making sure. Not the submarine. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So, so for world building, for actually making, making the world you're going to play it. So Equestria is great. There's a lot of material there. However, it's alarmingly trademarked. With, that is the dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot is... Trademark Hasbro cease and desist. Our favorite words. <laughs> That's okay. I'm gonna make my own world. It's gonna have hookers and blackjack. <laughs> yes. Hey, yes. you heard about my campaign, huh? Yes. And that kind of that kind of brings us nicely into the world of Everglow. I am not the subject matter expert there, David. We actually have. Yo, I saw our question. Question, yes. Uh, for a for a individual person at home running a game, trademark has nothing to do with nothing. If you want to lawyers will never jump in through your windows and said, "Stop right there." <laughs> if you want to play Pinkie Pie as the bard, you are more than welcome to. Please do. It's a lot of fun. However, See, the very the very moment you want to actually publish it, especially God forbid you actually want money for it, trademark becomes extremely important. <laughs> Hasbro wants their cut. The the more the more that you distribute it, the more that it becomes an issue. Like, I have um, characters with me here that I used at the game that we played. Look, here's a character you'll never recognize. I'm sure this pony is a complete stranger. Who are, who are these people? I don't know. <laughs> Original <laughs> character, do not steal. Steal. is an amazing OC. Oh, I, I might well, have I to add. I bring him. No, oh, I man. brought the, the, like, the main six plus Lyra. We got Sakura. It's great. It's... But because I'm just bringing them to the convention, just for demo purposes at the convention, I'm pretty sure Hasbro's not going to kill me. Pretty sure. But if I they try spies to, everywhere. if I put these Please don't kill us, Hasbro. online anywhere, then I would be inviting trouble. And I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so Good sorry, idea. you can't have them. <laughs> I'm going to take them anyway. So Same. we do have this really rich world that's been developed with Everglow. I've actually been running the campaign. Now, with, uh, with Sapphire, uh, I've been running kind of a weird, modified campaign. Uh, it's been really weird. There's been ups, there's been downs. Uh, there's a lot of homebrew stuff going on there. Uh, but it's mostly, 
mostly within the world of Everglow. Well, I I'm going to surprise you now, possibly. The way Everglow is written, your version of Everglow is just as canon as anything I write. Everglow itself is a great amorphous blob of horrors in which there are basically infinite probabilities, and they're all perfectly equally legit. Which is also why the book is written the way that it's written. The book talks about the deep past, the while in the middle, while the empire is still there, and then while the empire is nothing but ash. And it talks about them as if they're all basically there, because that's up to you which reality you feel like focusing on at any given moment. And, like, we have a character in one of the big books that actually I push a lot, Tribes of Everglow. They're short legs. They're That's little tiny one. ponies. They are like the them. They are the ponies of love. So what happened to them? Wiped out. <laughs> Sad they, face. They, they, they get kidnapped by the gem gnolls, basically our diamond dogs, and they're worked as slaves until they're gone. It's, it's, it's very sad. Yes, very much however, so. it is still presented in that book as a player option. How does that work? Welcome so, to the infinite probabilities. Funnily Maybe enough. in yours, you rescued them. <laughs> I've run several campaigns where they got up, ran off and rescued the short legs before they um, you know, got killed. Or lone survivor syndrome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was actually my first Pony Finder character was a short leg Yay. named <laughs> Vibrant Dreams. And she had a very rough time because she died. Oh. It was very sad. But she was reincarnated as a Pegasus. So this little teeny tiny pony now was much taller and had wings. So her big thing was that everyone else in the world shrank. <laughs> everyone. It wasn't her, it was everyone else. Suddenly she had these big blobs on her side, they got in the way all the time, and everyone shrunk. <laughs> I love that character. Truly, it was a good day. It was a good day. <laughs> so Dan, you're you're uh, fall of the Heartlands campaign. So tell us about a little bit a little bit of the world building with that. Uh, for starters, I want to give you credit for spelling Heartlands right, which is something I don't think anyone else <laughs> on the internet besides me has done. Um, Dear, uh, David here was talking about how his world of Everglow is this kind of uh, this 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 blob that could kind of just change and shift on a per campaign basis with. Everything being a level of canon. Heartlands is uh, sort of kind of the opposite of that. It's something I wanted to staunchly kind of set this rules and this lore in stone. And um, it was something that I created this land, this continent that's allegedly across the ocean from Equestria. Uh, that's basically the land of the, uh, the homeland of the deer uh, called Servidas. And I wanted something that felt like thematically could run parallel with the show and sort of exist in the same world, sure. but is definitely not Equestria. The Equestria we see in the show is this like beautiful, um, basically this like this this pinnacle of like utopia. Servidas is this messy sort of a uh, frontier that never really got the same the same life going as uh, as Equestria did. And but you say that. But even in the show, only Equestria proper is nice and idyllic. You step outside the country by like two feet, and all of a and sudden, and all of a sudden things terrible. are weird. Griffinstone, <laughs> yeah. for example. Exactly. That's yeah. the kind of yeah. Appaloosa. Yeah, exactly. Is that yeah. is that no, yeah, I thought it was. They, they have yet to show a not pony civilization that has its stuff together. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. no. They're working on it. <laughs> it's working One step at a time. So that was exactly the kind of thing I wanted to I wanted to explore. I like this idea that there's this like homeland of the deer and everything else like that, this like massive untamed nation and basically like pony settlers and explorers kind of started to like move in making boom towns and like making uh making everything doing everything doing mining and like settling things between like pilgrims and explorers, that kind of a thing, and all of a sudden there's now all of this trouble um, years after the wake of this war ended. And I wanted to come up with like something with really, really heavy lore, things that didn't just have like bandits for no reason or your quintessential murder hobos yeah, for no reason. Yeah, yeah, Every everything needed to kind of have, uh, I guess, an emotional centrifuge to it with uh, Fall of the Heartlands. Somebody raising a hand back there. Yep. 
I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> uh, I participated in a really young dark uh, role play based on the history of the Bible. Which was, uh, I remember it, yeah. What, what about those kinds of campaigns? With, with those kind of dystopian campaigns, that's, that's something you really you really need to be collaborating with your your GM or DM about because when you're when you literally every day every day every moment is a struggle not just to like get loot and make money or whatnot but just to survive uh, to to deal with the poisons the toxins the environment and everything else on top of it that's that is as harsh as you're going to get that's as far as you're going to get from the sunny idyllic everything is sunshines and rainbows equestria with full with with fallout equestria it is life is a struggle we had a we had a rather detailed Think of the foals, man. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that up. Yeah. Right. But ultimately, in almost any situation, I believe the most important thing is to have open dialogue amongst the table. Yeah. Everybody needs to be on the same page that they're actually trying to accomplish the same kind of game. If one person is trying to play the gritty surviving the harsh environment one person is trying to play actually fix the gritty environment that can actually come across as a great big clash and you end up with different people trying to get different things from the same game and then everybody's unhappy that's yeah. how a campaign falls apart <laughs> you kind of can't have a little pip and a pinkie pie in the same party it's not gonna work i'm sorry <laughs> i'll give you that <laughs> oh no. Okay, so I guess this one's mine, and I'm not sure entirely how well this works with a good portion of you. Um, I draw every single one of my characters, whether it's just a concept design or whatever. I know a lot of people don't have the ability or the time to do this. Um, some people will start with their character's personality, like Vibrant Dreams. She was this quirky little Pinkie Pie sort of character. Short, adorable, she's made me smile. I never had a design for her short legs version at all. No design. She was just fun in my head. But as a Pegasus, I had to figure out how does this change her perspective? Actually being able to see her helped me with that. You know, she's a different color, so the color that she sees right outside the front of her nose, what is this? It's something that would distract her. So she periodically, oh, look, a bird. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> yeah, very much so, because there was just this little things that would just catch her off guard because it wasn't something she was used to dealing with. So I had to figure out, okay, what are those things? Is the color that she's seeing around her, are they really distracting? Was she a muted kind of gray color before and now she's bright, obnoxious pink? I don't know about you, that would distract me. When I dye my hair, that distracts me. <laughs> um, some of the things that really help with making that character same is the design that you put into them um even for the gm side of things the dylan in your campaign one of brewer's favorite villains of mine is actually king jareth here yes. which i had a lot of fun designing yes my little goblin king um making that connection that your players will go oh, I know who that is. That is cool. I get what that villain's about. And then throwing a curveball in that, that's not your villain. Uh -huh. 
making those identifying traits the for Jareth his feather cloak his long blonde hair and his two colored eyes that will just help sell things to your your players so putting those together with either um, descriptions or actual images really help I think um, what do I have? uh how how many of you have actually used the general sod pony? Okay, <laughs> okay, I'm one of them. That's how I made my O my first OC, my Captain Hurricane OC. Uh, it's it's kind of useful. It's a quick and dirty way of making an OC, like figure out main or color or or what have you. It's it's also an easy way to kind of come up with ideas. For NPCs, if you're trying to make an, a pony o, like OC or an NPC there, um, and kind of get a rough idea of what what exactly you're looking for. Now, Sapphire, again, I'll, uh, I'll talk about my campaign with you. Like uh, GM's picking on the pony. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, Captain. Uh, Captain Barnacle and uh, Whiplash. Uh, those two I made with uh, I made with the Pony Creator, just because I can't draw worth a damn. Um, those of you who can, good on you. Well, keep working on it. Even though I can draw, I will admit in here and nowhere else that <laughs> I have used the General Zod to just give me inspiration. Like, I want this character. I don't know what I want them to be like. Okay, well, let's hit the random button eight million times and see what comes up. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, and you can come up with some really exciting designs that way. I always used it to kind of more mess around with, like, the uh, the color theory ideas, if, if anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's see here. I, I am the strange one out in this because... I am terrible at actual physical design. That's I don't do aesthetics. Me. I will draw all about, I mean, draw. I will write all about a person and their personality and what they do and the places they go and the adventures they go on. And I still have no idea what they look like. <laughs> that's why you have me. And that's when I go to my artist and say, could you draw this person? I mean, I, I know they have a horn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he does do that. I'm, I'm pretty afraid. sure they have four hooves. Four, not three, not, not five. <laughs> so we're going to push the brand of destiny here. Or that's what the cutie mark is called in Pony Finder because we can't call it a cutie mark. Damn the trademarks. Damn you, Hasbro! <laughs> Just like any My Little Pony character, your brand of destiny helps define you. You know, you can just look at it and go, okay, that's kind of what this character is about. That's what they're aiming for. This helps in their interactions with other characters, and maybe it causes a few problems. You know, if you walk around with a giant cheese sandwich on your hind legs, you know, you never know what other people are going to think about it. <laughs> maybe it has something to do with cooking. Maybe it has nothing to do with cooking. Who knows? It's, it's like a feat, for well, those of you who are familiar with 3.5. That's and, and one thing I want to throw a feat. out there as a difference between Pony Finder and Equestrium. In Equestria, you get your brands because you did something. You had some realization. Even if you messed up that realization, you were doing something at that moment, and then the mark, the mark appears. So at least you have a hint as to what it's supposed to mean. <laughs> some hint. A or clue. A tiny hint. In Pony Finder, you pop out of your parent. It's already there. What does it mean? Nobody knows. Now, this can actually be a great character development thing. You can grow up thinking it means this and then find out, wait, maybe it means this other thing. Like, what if you have a, a bunch of bricks and you think, oh, okay, I'm supposed to be like a builder. I mean, obviously, it's just a, it's a stack of bricks. What else is it supposed to mean? And eventually you find out you're actually supposed to be like a defender of this great wall. Like, that, that's jarring. <laughs> that is not what you prepared for. Yeah. As a GM, it's a great tool to use to help give your characters something to strive for. Just giving them those little hints like, this has something to do with building, and so does your cutie mark. Oh, wait, maybe this is something I should look into. It might help me along the way. 
and maybe it has nothing to do with you, but it'll make you feel like it does. And that's something that's extremely important in running your games, is making sure your players feel like they specifically have a place in this world. So, so another thing that's more of my, more of my kind of domain is like personality traits. Uh, now for personality traits, there's, uh, for those of you who are into psychology, uh, some of you may, may be familiar with uh, like the personality, what is it like the? Myers-Briggs, thank you. Uh, the the Myers-Briggs personality scale, like the 16, like the 16 different personalities. I, I think I'm like in between INFP and like E, ENFJ, something like that personally, uh, for those of you who care. But, uh, but those are some considerations that you, you might want to look into when you're developing like your character, the way they look at the world, the way they, they feel about themselves. Are they extroverted? Are they introverted? Uh, are they more of a fluttershy? Are they more of a rarity? Like how, how do they present themselves? Uh, and that's, that's kind of an important consideration, especially when it pertains to role playing, because that, that is essentially the way they look at the world and the way they're going to react to certain situations. So I'm, I'm going to toss this out there. <laughs> Just in case anybody here likes writing in general, are there any writers out here? Oh, there, All right. there we go. We got writers. All of this is like equally 100% important when you're writing anything role-playing or not, you're going to want to consider all of this in your characters. Every single one of them, so have fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, you should be having fun. You should. <laughs> Otherwise, why are we doing it? So I'm not sure. I think we're, we're almost, almost at the end. I think this is the last slide I have here. So, <laughs> so pony-specific treasure. Uh, so you've got your you've got your OC, you've got their personality, you know what they're gonna do, you know what they're gonna say, you know how they're gonna present themselves to the world. Now you need to figure out what loot you're going to get and what you're going to do when you get it. Uh, one thing specifically for Pathfinder and Pony Finder, um, and that's something I I was meaning to talk talk to you about, David, Hello. is how you figured out like the way like hooves work like the like, like the treasures specifically for ponies like with like having four hooves like boots well, or like uh like rings because it's kind of weird i started off with a basic and goal. horn yeah exactly yes i started off with a basic goal and the basic goal was i wanted ponies to work in pathfinder or 5e or whatever game they happen to be in without making everything else stop working which is bad. We don't want that. So if a pony finds a ring and he's like, oh man, that's a sweet ring. I totally want this. Um, I could have just said, well, they can't wear it too bad. <laughs> but if that you would don't have fingers, where do you put it? I mean, but that would be unbalancing to the pony. So instead, if they tried to put the ring on, it turns into a nice little wrist anklet at the bottom of their uh, hook. And it just kind of dangles there. Fairy and magic is the best. <laughs> I mean, there is another reason why I chose to make them fey. <laughs> because when you make them fey, everything else kind of makes sense. There are many people who, who looked at me and said, what, they're, they're not magical um, beasts of some sort? And it's like, no, they're not. They are straight, highly magical, intelligent creatures attuned to the elements. They're fey. They are the definition of fey. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and that that helped get around that. So you know, with that in mind, I thought, okay, what happens if they put on shoes? It would look kind of stupid if they had shoes on, let's say, their front legs and not their back legs, or if they put on their back legs and their front legs don't have anything. What happens if they try to put on two different kinds of shoes? That would really be terrible. We don't <laughs> a want a little bit. So I decided, okay, if they put on shoes, any sh any magical shoes, they cover all the hooves. Just, there were two. Now there's four. They take them off. Now there's two. 
<laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> it's just easier. I see a question. Well, there is a catch for you that a lot of people miss. Oh, no. But it, it, one thing to remember, wondrous items will resize to fit you. Armor? No. And a sword? Nope. So you find some armor made for a dwarf? Yeah, you weren't fit in that. <laughs> but I can try. <laughs> <laughs> then it will not work, no. Um... One thing that I have found that actually does imbalance things just a little bit is the fact that I actually let, let horses wear horseshoes because they didn't balance the horseshoes at all. They really didn't. They really didn't. <laughs> they didn't see Pony Finder coming. No, they did not but balance those have. horseshoes at all. So it's like, oh, now Thanks, players James can Jacobs. wear them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that is one part I failed. Wait, so does that mean I get to wear my Zephyr shoes and boots at some point? No, if you're wearing horseshoes, they count as boots. They take up the boot slot. Okay. So you cannot wear horseshoes and magic boots at the same time. You're wearing one or the other, not both. <laughs> That's just the way that works. <laughs> Actually, technically, by the rules, you could put on horseshoes and then put on some magic shoes. The magic shoes just wouldn't do anything, but they would be there. It would at least stop people from seeing the horseshoes. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, as the GM, you have to make the call. DM rule is law. Rule number zero. The rule is so important, you forgot to count. Exactly. <laughs> no. We don't talk about that. Stop talking about it. The You're DM right. is always right. That's rule number one. Rule number two is refer to new rule number one if you have any questions. <laughs> Except for when he's not. So that should be, that should that's, be everything. that's everything. So we'll open up the floor to questions. Any questions, questions you guys have? Yes. <laughs> rule number three is I definitely think that's rule, half a to rule five. Rule. And, and, and Sapphire, I know there's been some points where it's been questionable. It's been a little weird trying to get from point A to point B, and it's not always been entertaining for you guys that's my biggest consideration is are are my players having fun are they enjoying themselves okay. if the answer to that question is yes it's been a good session if the answer is no figure out what the hell you're doing wrong and revisit see here's the thing igm like i write which could be a good or a bad thing which is i don't plan i try my hardest not to plan and things will happen as I feel that it should be natural to happen, which means that I surprise myself all the time. It's, it's like, very oh, right, that, that's just the way that should work. Uh, I'm running a campaign right now that is set after the Empire. As the, as, but as the Empire was falling apart, the players actually leapt in and put the brakes on the Empire falling apart, and they installed a new Empress. So that was cool. But now the new Empress is like, okay, now you have to go out to all the other towns where the other rulers were and get them to all re-sign up with the crew. And I circled a bunch of towns that they had to go to. And I picked them pretty much around. Okay, that town, that town, that town. Oh, God, definitely that town, that town. <laughs> and, Love and now, me or fear me. And now the There's players no are between. wandering around some different places. And as they arrive to the town, I, I have no idea before they get to the town what the, what's wrong with that town. When they arrive, I would quickly look up the town and say, okay, what would be wrong with this town that makes sense for this town? So the first town they went to was like this high alchemist place, and they end up with a ruler that is like really snobby and uh, prissy, but actually isn't really in charge because the alchemy colleges already ruled themselves, basically. But she thinks he's in charge. And so they eventually intimidated her into rejoining the Empire, and all the colleges are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what we wanted no, anyway. They went to an... Oh, I see a question. I have a world now. 
But the world di- didn't create itself. That that was a hodgepodge. <laughs> Some of it I'm still adding to. Things happen. <laughs> yes. I have a framework. Well, it helps to play in a world that's already there. I mean, you know, it took me a while to make Everglow, but now it's there, so now I can play in it, and I can have fun in it. But you don't have to even play there. There are three million fantasy worlds out there. You want to play in Forgotten Realms, Faerun? That's a good place. Do Dark Sun. Everybody's forgotten all the details of Dark Sun. You'll be the only one who knows. <laughs> yeah, and, and my you can ca- surprise everybody all the time. Let's not talk about Ravenloft. Oh, that may or may not be uh, a great place for ponies to play. Saying, fi- find a framework that loosely matches what you want and run with it. Run the hell out of it. Fly. fly I'll get back to you on that. That might be, uh, that might be synergistic. Yes. A little bit. No, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So here's the thing. I have not like specifically played a grim dark campaign, but I've done grim dark sessions, and I actually find them to be more impactful when you're in a place that is fairly light, and then suddenly things get dark. So like my group are off. They're adventurers. They're running around. They're galloping across the countryside, getting things done. They arrive at this town that is specifically known for its somewhat creepy sanatorium. <laughs> so, of course, they end up visiting the sanatorium, and they eventually discover that this place is a pit of utter nightmare, where um, the person in charge, though, the person who's at the door, is actually a paladin, a perfectly good-hearted paladin. The trick is that the place literally is of nightmares, so the paladin is immune to the fear and doesn't know that anything is wrong with this place. <laughs> the paladin has no idea. I am completely oblivious. But the doctors, the doctors that work there, they're all psycho. They, the, the whole place is just festering with all of your worst nightmares. The illusions run rapid, shadows come out at you. I was playing creepy music while it was all going on. I'm talking about things creeping in the darkness. I had the players all on edge. It was great. And then there's this chipper paladin. Hi, how can I help? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, the, the juxtaposition totally helped. It's great. <laughs> yes. Can all this be applied to online role playing games too? I'm talking about Absolutely. online role playing. Absolutely. I am. That's almost pretty this much exclusively what I do. Um, a lot of the games that me and David have played together were through Roll20. It's free for everyone to use. You can just drop any of your content in, you know, take screenshots, whatever you want to do, drop it in there and. Yes, you are. And there are horse Not games entirely. <laughs> Just mostly. That's, that's more so for my panel tomorrow night. <laughs> Better bronies through homebrewing. <laughs> there are many, many <laughs> utilities available to you for online games. You can't find someone to play the game you want to play in person. That is perfectly fine. You don't have to force your friends into something they aren't comfortable with. We all understand that being in this community, that that's just something we have to face. There are so many of us out there who just have to reach out, and we are all online available. Yes. That's actually interesting. I'm far more comfortable with typed. I like typing. I can get into character more. I can describe things better. I'm not very good I feel. speaking. Um, David, however, runs all of his games verbally. All of them. And that's great. Unless you're like really uncomfortable and shy like I am. I know I don't seem like it, but I'm huge, hugely shy. <laughs> It does. It is. It's lower. It does. Well, see, here's the thing. If you're doing text role play, you can't be in it for the speed. 
You really can't. You're, you're in it for the detail. You're in it for the nitty gritty. And that's great. Enjoy that. Embrace that. If you're in it, if you're in it for the speed, you got to use your mouth. You really do. You got to start talking. It kind of depends on what you're valuing. Yeah, something that also might help um, is your group size. If there's only three of you, that's not a problem. If there are six, seven, eight of you, you're going to be stumbling on each other. And someone is, is going to get wait, lost. I'm going to point out there is one other thing you could do. You could text the roleplay and switch over to voice when there's combat, get the combat over with, go back to the text. That's actually something that me and these guys over here did for a while there. <laughs> Is I would run it where all the conversation between the characters would be done in text. That way you can get those thoughts in that you wouldn't necessarily think of. And then when we got to the combat section, we just switched over real quick. All right, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Okay, describe that for me real quick. Let's get through this. Okay, good. Let's move on. Or, uh, or with our Discord server, uh, we have like the RP deck and like the main deck, where the action's all in the main deck. Like the other side stuff is all like RP behind the scenes can be done like in the background. It it can be. Rolls I prefer I prefer in person gaming. That's my preference, but. You gotta do what you gotta do in order to get people to the table. I don't know about anyone else. I'm a fan of fantasy rounds, just saying. <laughs> Those are so much fun, oh my god. One of one of my most uh favorite characters is uh is a mute character actually, and uh yeah, it's you. You gotta get really creative with things like hoof gestures, doing a lot of um, really explaining things like facial expressions, and you you basically almost have to double up on their descriptive writing in every single situation. You gotta really go overboard with the facial expressions and the way that they move. All right, Deadpool over here has got a stand up too. Yes. See, GURPS, see. Yep. 100%. 100%. I'm not making GURPS funny. Game. The player character eventually got sick of it, like the other players, and he, I can't remember if it was a device or some sort of spell they cast on my character, but found a way so that I could talk mentally with them. But that ruins the fun, though, right? No, but they didn't Everyone wants to, like, cure the mute character or the blind I character? Everyone's snake eyes, like, legitimately G.I. Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that that's something a lot. that I actually faced in a oracle that I played. She would speak in celestial whenever she was stressed, which came in really handy during combat. Um, <laughs> so she could not coordinate with the party at all, and it was kind of hilarious. But it's just some you can either use it as something fun. But if it starts to wear on people, you might have to rethink about what you're doing. Otherwise, uh, that's all the time we've got for tonight. It is midnight. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I know we were opposite many other panels, and I really do appreciate all of you coming us coming out to see us tonight. I feel like we're a little family or something now. <laughs> Yay, I love my family. We did have one last question, though, if you still wanted to ask it. Yeah, that's true. So, also wanted to say thank you for uh, our wonderful, uh, our wonderful support, guys. Thank you again, Ben. Uh, I'm not sure who you are, but thank you. Thank you for coming to my first panel ever. I appreciate that.